Good afternoon. The first item of business this afternoon is portfolio questions on health, wellbeing and sport. And as ever, in order to get as many people in as possible, uh, short and succinct questions and answers would be helpful. Question number one, Colin Beattie. To ask the Scottish Government how many GP appointments were missed by patients in the last 12 months. Thank you. Cabinet Secretary Shona Robinson. As independent contractors, GP partners are responsible for their own practice appointment and patient consultation arrangements. However, the Scottish Government expects health boards and their contracted practices to ensure that satisfactory appointment systems are in place for patients reviewing outlier performance and providing advice and support where necessary. Additionally, as part of the negotiated General Medical Services contract settlement for 2014-15, access will be reviewed in Scottish GP practices by March 2015. Many thanks. Colin Beatty. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that response. I have recently myself been in discussions with local GPs as to what solutions can be employed to minimise missed appointments and so ease the burden on GP practices. Can the Cabinet Secretary update the Parliament on what initiatives the Government is undertaking to enable patients to easily cancel appointments? Cabinet Secretary. I can tell the, the, the member that uh, online services are currently available to all GP practices in Scotland via existing clinical systems and the Scottish Government officials are actively looking to promote the uptake and usage of these services, which include online appointments and repeat prescriptions. And we certainly welcome any new and innovative ideas, and I'd be happy to keep the member informed about the progress of this. Thank you. Richard Simpson? Um, at the last audit, Cabinet Secretary, I think it was only about 50% of people were, of practices were actually using this. So the initiative to increase its welcome. And I know the government's announced that there'll be an inspection system for general practice. Well, well that, that's about 18 months behind England, which has been going for that length of time. When will it actually start the inspection system? And will they look at the recent article by Ron Neville, a GP in Dundee, who um, has a, an appointment system, which seems to me to be absolute best practice, and hopefully the government might look at this and promote it. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, well, certainly work is going on apace on the, the new uh, inspection system for uh, GPs, but I'll update the member perhaps at the meeting that we have towards the end of, of this month. Uh, I agree. I think the, uh, the, the system that you've described um, that, that Ron uh, Neville has developed is something that uh, we should be having a, a closer look at. And as I've said before, I'm always keen to make sure that the best practice in these matters is ruled out elsewhere. So again, I'll be able to update the member further on that at the end of the month. Nanette Milne. Thank you. The Cabinet Secretary will be aware of, of the pilots by a number of GP practices to use text messaging to help reduce the number of missed appointments and to help patients manage their health care. Uh, what plans does the Scottish Government have to roll this out across the NHS health boards? Yeah. Cabinet Secretary. <coughs> Again, as I said to Richard Simpson, I, I think these innovative ways, and some of them are very simple, and given the use of of text messaging more generally. I, I think it's a very effective way of, of reminding people about their appointments, but also giving an opportunity for someone uh, to cancel their appointment in uh, advance, which is obviously an appointment can be given to someone else. So again, I'm very keen that all of these things become the sort of standard practice. Obviously, that sometimes takes longer than we would all wish. But again, I'm happy to provide the member with a, an update on how we're going to, to, to make sure that we roll that out as quickly as possible. Many thanks. Question number two, <coughs> Mark MacDonald. To ask the Scottish Government what recent discussions it has had with local authorities that have yet to submit a draft or completed autism strategy. Minister Jamie Hepburn. The Scottish Government are funding a national coordination team based in Strathclyde University to bridge between the Scottish autism strategy and its implementation at a local level. In the last few months, this team has made contact with all local authorities and the nine local authorities yet to submit a draft are finalising them locally and submitting to committees for sign-off. They have until the 31st of March 2015 to submit their action plans and strategies. The National Coordination Team are meeting with all local autism, authorities' autism leads on 19th of January to continue these discussions. Thank you, Matt Macdonald. I thank the Minister for his answer. The Minister may be aware that Aberdeen City Council has not yet submitted a draft or completed autism strategy. And I note the Minister says they have until 31st March 2015, but my understanding was when the funding was initially allocated, the hope would be that these would be submitted by March 2014. Uh, I'm due to meet the Council leader next week to discuss this issue, uh, and I'm concerned that the autism strategy appears to have been conflated with the Council's school inclusion review, which, while important, is not the same thing. Can I ask the Minister if he has received information from 
Aberdeen City Council as to when its autism strategy will be completed, given the anxieties of service users and their families that this important piece of work has been ongoing for some considerable time with no visible sign of progress? Minister. Uh, well, can I first of all uh, acknowledge uh, Mr Macdonald's uh, personal and political uh, interest in this uh, matter? He is a great champion on uh, this particular uh, issue. I can tell uh, him in the Chamber that Aberdeen City Council have given uh, the Scottish Government uh, assurances that their uh, uh, strategy, their autism strategy, was being finalised uh, last week and it would be submitted to the Scottish Government uh, this week. I am aware that the final draft it was an officer going before the uh, committee at Aberdeen City Council this month and once signed off, uh, the final uh, uh, strategy will uh, be made uh, public. And I want to reinforce the point I have already made. The Scottish Government will continue to hold discussions with local authorities to ensure that all autism strategies and action plans are made public. Many thanks. Briefly, please, Rosie Grant. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Constituents have come to see me telling me that the strategy isn't working and they feel that there is no access to appropriate services in Highland, le leaving themselves and their families unsupported. I'm pleased that the, a coordination um, that Strathclyde have been asked to coordinate the, um, the national strategy, but I'm asking what work will they do with local authorities and indeed NHS boards and what work will they also do to include service users and their families in designing local, um, local services for them? Minister. Well, I, I can inform Ms uh, Grant that uh, Highland Council is one of the councils that has uh, submitted uh, its draft. We would, uh, of course, always want to make sure that uh, service users and those who take a great interest in this matter are consulted upon. And uh, indeed, the, uh, the team that I have referred to will maintain a great interest in what is happening in uh, the Highland Council here and, uh, of course, across the country, President Officer. Many thanks. Question number three, James Kelly. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish, Scottish Government how many acute hospitals in Scotland were in red alert in, the, in each of the last week of 2014 and the first week of 2015. Cabinet Secretary Shona Robinson. While hospitals have experienced pressures over the recent holiday period, none have needed to declare a major incident due to the demands that they were facing. On a daily basis, boards have been keeping the Scottish Government informed about pressures and actions that are being taken to address these. Additional support has been provided to the boards where required. Thank you. James Kelly. Thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. There is no doubt that in recent weeks the crisis in Scotland's a and has intensified, uh, with many patients facing unacceptable long uh, waiting times, including constituents of mine. Uh, does the Cabinet Secretary agree that that is unacceptable? Does she accept responsibility? And can she say uh, in each of the last two weeks how many patients have waited greater than 12 hours? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, can I say to, to James Kelly that uh, absolutely uh, that is uh, unacceptable that anyone has to wait longer than they should? Uh, in a &E, but of course the pressure on A&Es uh, across Scotland and of course across the rest of these islands has been unprecedented. Uh, Glasgow, for example, uh, have told me in some detail about the, the level of, uh, of very, very sick elderly patients that are turning up in numbers that they have not seen during winter pressures in any other year, many more admissions than normal, which of course puts pressure on the whole system. Uh, in answer to his question uh, specifically, the number of 12-hour waits in the Greater Glasgow and Clyde uh, area for the week ending the 11th of January was 84. Um, that is um, actually a, a significant number of the, of the 175 for the whole of Scotland. Um, those patients should not have had to wait 12 hours, but I think we do need to understand that staff in A&E were doing absolutely the best that they could that the winter pressure preparations uh, had been um, gone through in great detail and that staff and managers had put in place everything that they could have. But unfortunately, due to the, the surge of patients who were crying to be, uh, having to be admitted, um, the A&E departments, particularly in Glasgow and Clyde, faced um, unprecedented pressure. However, we will absolutely learn the lessons from this winter and in preparation for the months coming, we will make sure that we deal with some of those pressures, particularly the delayed discharges, which were not the whole story, given the level of admissions, but certainly do add to the pressure that boards are facing. Thank you. Question number four, Margaret McDougall. 
Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government when it last met with NHS, Ayrshire and Arran and what issues were discussed. Cabinet Secretary. Can I say to Margaret McDougall that uh, ministers and Scottish Government regularly meet with representatives of health boards, including uh, NHS Ayrshire and Arran, to discuss matters of importance to local people. And it was a pleasure to conduct NHS Ayrshire and Arran's annual review, the first one I've done uh, since becoming Cabinet Secretary. Thank you, Margaret McDougall. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. As the Cabinet Secretary will know, Crosshouse Hospital has been in the headlines for the wrong reasons recently. Firstly, £1.3 million worth of surgical equipment was stolen and sold on the black market. This led to cancellations of operations and, of course, the cost of replacement. And secondly, an unannounced inspection found widespread blood contamination of patient equipment in maternity and A&E departments. A second inspection a month later saw some improvement, but still it didn't get a clean bill of health. Staff are doing all they can, but they are underfunded and overstretched. Are these two issues indicative of what is happening to our health service across Scotland under this Scottish Government? Because they recently announced uh, 3.2 million for please. Ayrshire and Arran. I'm just coming to it, and that won't even cover the replacing of stolen instruments. So what is the Cabinet Secretary going to do to ensure that our once envied health service is properly funded and supported? Cabinet Secretary. Well, our health service still is envied uh, across the world and it is properly funded. A £380 million uh, rise in the budget next year, breaching £12 billion for the first time ever. Now, by any reasonable person's standards, £12 billion is a lot of money for the health budget. But can I turn to Cross House Hospital itself? And I have to say I was very impressed with the hospital and the staff who were working very hard within it when I visited um, Cross House. The surgical equipment being stolen um, was reprehensible that that happened. And of course, the police investigation uh, has, uh, is, is ongoing and has reached a, 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 an advanced stage. Um, the inspection reports are important. And actually, of course, previously, there were no such uh, inspection regimes. And I think it is really important, even when it makes difficult reading, that HEI are going in and shining a light on all of our hospitals, particularly when they're unannounced. And it means, therefore, that they can uh, know where they have to put matters right. And, of course, a lot of work has gone on by Ayrshire and Arran, Ar Ar particularly at Cross House Hospital, to address the issues within those inspection reports. I will say to Margaret McDougall, there is still more to be done, and I'm the first to accept that. But let's not undersell the good things that our NHS provides and the hard-working staff within it. Supplementary John Scott. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The Cabinet Secretary will be aware of the ongoing lack of bed availability at Air and Cross House Hospitals, with occasional but regular closures of Cross House Hospital, leading to extra burdens on staff, particularly at Air Hospital. Notwithstanding the almost Herculean efforts of nurses and doctors at both hospitals, this entirely foreseeable, predictable and now well-documented problem remains. And my question is, what is the Cabinet Secretary doing by way of discussion and planning with NHS Ayrshire and Arran senior management to get this now long-standing problem resolved? Cabinet Secretary. Um, can I thank uh, John Scott for his question? Uh, yes, this is absolutely a, a, a discussion that is going on uh, between ourselves and Ayrshire and Arran. It's very important that all parts of the health system have the right number of beds in the right places with the right staff to support them at the right time. Uh, what we also need to do, though, is to make sure those beds are being used to their optimum. And because of the issue and challenge of delayed discharge, at the moment that is not the case because too many beds are being uh, used by people who do not require them because they're not being able to be discharged because of all the reasons that we know in terms of uh, care in the community and some of the support requirements there. We are doing uh, a lot around that and I'll have more to say about that in the, the next few weeks. But I can assure John Scott that those discussions are ongoing and I will write to him to update him on the latest. Question number five, Joan McAlpine. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government the progress, um, which po to provide an update of the progress of the new Dumfries and Galloway Royal Infirmary. Cabinet Secretary. 
The replacement for the Dumfries and Galloway Royal Infirmary is currently progressing as planned, construction commencing in the spring of this year, following financial close of the project in February. The board is working in partnership with the consortium High Wood Health, appointed as preferred bidder. Full unconditional planning consent for the project was obtained on the 16th of December. The construction and handover of the new hospital to the Health Board by HWH is planned for the end of August 2017 to become fully operational by the end of that year. John McAlpine. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. NHS Dumfries and Galloway have said that they are fully committed to deliver real community benefits as part of the procurement construction and operational phase of the hospital project. Could the Cabinet Secretary outline what sustainable training, employment and local development opportunities the project will bring? Cabinet Secretary. Yes, I, I can. NHS Dumfries and Galloway have a requirement in the project agreement for targeted community benefits, including recruitment and training, small and medium enterprise supplier development and educational opportunities. Highwood Health, the project delivery partner, are working closely with Dumfries and Galloway employment and education specialists, and this includes a commitment to create 150 new jobs, 36 of which will be apprenticeships. NHS Dumfries and Galloway Board's project team as enablers will work in partnership with HWH and the agencies to maximise opportunities arising during the delivery of this contract. Thank you. Question number six, Alex Riley. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how many times NHS 5 failed to meet its four, eight and 12 hour accident and emergency waiting time targets between the 24th of December 2014 and the 4th of January 2015. Cabinet Secretary. Unvalidated figures have been reported to the Government for the two-week festive period. NHS Fife's four-hour a &E performance for core a &E departments was 87.3% in the two weeks ending the 4th of January this year. Official ISD Scotland statistics on a &E activity for October, November and December of last year will be published on February the 3rd. a &E figures will then be published on a monthly basis thereafter. Thank you. Alex Shirley. Yeah, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for her response. and I would obviously want to put on record my sincere thanks to all those workers and our hospitals and across the public services who are working over Christmas and New Year um, to look after and care for our elderly and most vulnerable in our communities. The figures I have is for four hours 154 times, eight hours 25 times and 12 hours target three times. Um, and I would be grateful for a, minister, a meeting with the Minister to follow that up. She has previously, uh, in, in the previous question, talked about delayed discharges. And is she aware that in five, um, NHS five took a decision to um, shift nine patients and then followed up by another 13 patients into care homes without um, the, the guidelines and, and, and the assessment, the social work assessment actually taking place, which is a form of, of boarding patients into care homes. Does she support such a move and will she agree to look into and respond to me uh, whether this is a change in policy and practice taking place in terms of boarding patients into care homes? Cabinet Secretary. Can I say to Alex Riley, first of all, I would be happy to meet with them to discuss uh, these issues in uh, more detail. Uh, NHS Fife and Fife Council, uh, as I'm sure the member is aware, uh, came in to see me jointly to discuss the challenges of delayed discharge within their area. And it was actually a very productive meeting. From that meeting, a number of actions were agreed and Scottish Government officials have been supporting the partnership in taking forward some of those measures. Some of that is to look at the, the boosting of, uh, of home care to get people obviously moving safely home. However, one of the other uh, areas was the opening of what we call intermediate care beds. So these are beds that are step up, step down beds that can be used for people who are um, ready for discharge, but perhaps not ready to go home. Uh, so they are not people who are boarded out because they are ready for discharge, but they're people who maybe need a bit of reha rehabilitation to be able to go home independently. But I'm happy to discuss that in more detail with Alex Rowley in, in due course. Many thanks. Question number seven, Bill Kidd. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether it can provide an update regarding the proposed Commonwealth Games legacy sporting facilities that will benefit the people of Glasgow. 
Minister Jamie Hepburn. Glasgow 2014 has been used as a catalyst to raise the profile of sport in Glasgow, accelerate the development of sport and create a lasting legacy of world-class sporting facilities. The people of Glasgow continue to benefit from the fantastic facilities used to host the Commonwealth Games, such as the Emirates Arena and the Glasgow National Hockey Centre. Furthermore, communities across Scotland have been supported by the Legacy 2014 Active Places Fund since its launch in 2012. A total of 154 projects from 31 local authorities, including 13 in Glasgow, have received awards totalling over £8.1 million. Thank you, Bill Kidd. I thank the Minister for that answer. I am wondering if he could furnish me with any information on the possibility of a development of any all-weather 3G pitches in my Glasgow Annie's Land constituency. Minister. It, well, what I can say uh, to Mr Kidd is certainly there has been uh, investment in his uh, constituency in terms of sports facilities. There are nine community sports hubs uh, up and running in Glasgow, including an area-based hub in Drumchapel, based on a variety of local venues, including the high school sports centre and leisure centre, and a disability sports hub based at Scots and Leisure Centre. I'm sure he'll be interested in that. In terms of uh, 3G uh, pitches in his uh, constituency, you should see Sports Scotland has not provided any funding towards uh, 3G pitches uh, there in recent years, but there are, of course, various uh, funding sources uh, available which can be applied for for sports projects, including the installation of 3G pitches. And if there is any specific project in Ireland that can be of assistance in pointing Mr Kidd or others in uh, the direction of those funding sources, Mr Kidd just needs to ask. Thank you. Question number eight, Jim Hume. Uh, thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what plans it has to increase the number of mental health officers being trained. Minister Jamie Hepburn. Local authorities have a legal duty to appoint a sufficient number of mental health officers to discharge functions under the relevant legislation. They must decide on the number of mental health officers appointed in the area, area taking into account local needs and circumstances. The Scottish Social Services Council's latest mental health officers report indicates a 39% increase in admissions to mental health officer award programmes in 2013-14. Jim Hume. Minister, for his reply, uh, evidence from that Scottish uh, Social Services Council shows that the number of mental health officers is declining and the workforce is ageing. The Mental Welfare Commission state that 42% of emergency detentions in hospitals had no mental health officer consent, even though that should be the case, and that 62% of short-term detentions did not have a social circumstances report critical to patients getting the right treatment and care. When will the government address the shortage of mental health officers and uh, look to have a Scottish-wide recruitment and training strategy uh, for them this year? Minister. Well, uh, of course, uh, I should say that we will always take seriously the views of the Scottish Social Service Council and the Mental Welfare Commission and others who express a view in relation to these matters. I would go back to my original answer and make the point again that the uh, latest uh, mental health officer report indicates a 39% increase in admissions to the Mental Health Officer Award programmes in 2013-14, but we are uh, exploring uh, mental health officer capacity and other issues with key stakeholders, including uh, local authorities and mental health officers, to better understand uh, what the issues are and what plans there are at a local level to uh, address any shortfall in mental health officers. Uh, this is something that the government places great priority in, President Officer. Thank you. Briefly, please, Mary Scanlon. Uh, can the Minister tell me, given that uh, the out-of-hours mental health officers is now at an all-time low, what recourse do mental health patients have to the government when there is no mental health officer there to provide them with the advice and support that they need in accordance with the Mental Health Act? Minister. Well, of course, this uh, government takes very seriously uh, the provision of mental health services across uh, Scotland. I've made the point that uh, capacity is increasing. We uh, hope to be able to see more mental health officers come on stream. I should make the point, of course, President Officer, that uh, the uh, workforce planning is a matter for each individual local authority, but of course, uh, uh, as part of its uh, responsibilities in terms of uh, mental health, uh, just on the 20th of November, uh, this uh, government uh, announced uh, additional investment of £15 million over the next three years to improve uh, mental health services. I think that gives some indication in terms of the importance we place in this area. Many thanks. Question number nine, Richard Lyle. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what steps it is taking to promote women's football. Jamie Hepburn. The Scottish Government is a committed supporter of Scottish women's football and recognises the positive impact football it can have in communities throughout Scotland. In May 2014, under the Cashback for Communities programme, the Scottish FA it was awarded up to £2.25 million through to 2017. This funding is supporting the development of various aspects of girls and women's football, including proactive engagement with girls via regional development officers to increase participation for females aged between 9 and 24. 
Richard Lyle. I can thank the Minister for his answer, and I know he is uh, a committed football supporter. Um, I note that, sadly, Scotland women football team did not uh, unfortunately qualify for the 2015 World Cup in Canada. What steps has the Scottish Government taken to improve their chances of qualifying for the next Women's Football World Cup in 2019? Minister? Well, uh, whilst the Women's National Team did unfortunately not uh, qualify for the 2015 uh, World Cup in Canada, I think we should uh, recognise uh, the tremendous progress uh, they uh, made as a team. Uh, President, obviously, performed very well uh, in a strong uh, qualification group, reaching the playoffs for the first time in their history, and uh, they now are ranked 21st in the uh, FIFA World Rankings and 12th in uh, the European I, think, uh, I hope Mr uh, Lyle and others in the Chamber would understand that they don't particularly want ministerial responsibility for guaranteeing whether or not mm. our national teams qualify for international tournaments. But I would go back to uh, my initial answer, which uh, demonstrates the uh, significant funding that we are leveraging into uh, women's football uh, directly. And of course, uh, we also commit 500, have committed £500,000 each year since 2008 to support the Active Girls programme, which aims to increase the number of girls participating in PE, physical activity and sport in and around schools, which of course uh, includes football. So we are uh, committed uh, in that end and certainly I am sure I speak for the whole chamber when I say I wish uh, the women's national team uh, all the very best in their efforts to qualify for the next World Cup. Thank you. Question number 10, Liam MacArthur. Uh, thank you. To ask the Scottish Government how often the Short Life Working Group on Heart Failure has met and what conclusions it has reached regarding strength strengthening the role of heart failure nurses. Minister Maureen Watt. The Heart Failure Hub has met in a formal capacity twice and has been integral to two learning events, the second of which will take place on 6 February 2015. The national programme of work being taken forward by the Heart Failure Hub recognises that heart failure care is critically dependent on heart failure teams, with heart failure nurses being central to this. To this end, we have appointed two heart failure nurses to support the work of the Heart Failure Hub and to draw heart failure nurses even more closely into this advancing agenda. Thank you, Liam McCarthy. Can I thank the Minister for her uh, response and also belatedly welcome her to her uh, post. Uh, the Minister will be aware that Orkney, I think, is the only area in the country without a heart failure nurse. It's an issue I raised in the Chamber back in 2013. It's a concern of the Orkney Heart Support Group. Uh, we've been in regular contact with the uh, NHS Orkney Board. NHS Orkney themselves accept that the heart failure nurse could be cost effective, beneficial to patients and reduce hospital readmissions. So will the Minister agree to engage uh, with the Board in Orkney to see whether the appointment of a heart failure nurse in Orkney can be included in the Board's uh, delivery plan for the coming year? Maureen Watt. Yes, I'm happy to engage uh, with NHS Orkney uh, on this, and they do recognise, as the member has said, uh, that it doesn't have a heart failure nurse uh, service as detailed in the Scottish Heart Failure Nurse Forum 2013 report. However, I think we should recognise that Orkney currently has two consultant physicians in post and have recently recruited a third consultant physician. Heart failure patients in Orkney are cared for in a shared manner between the physicians based at Balfour Hospital, both with previous cardiologist experience, NHS Grampian and the local primary care teams. Although Orkney does not have uh, a formal heart failure nurse service, the consultant physicians uh, cardiac specialist nurse who is a heart failure nurse practitioner and hospital, the hospital pharmacist all provide advice to any member of the multidisciplinary team caring for a patient with heart failure in Orkney. Thank you. Question number 11, Roderick Campbell. Ask the Scottish Government what support it provides to people with lipidemia. Minister Maureen Watt. Uh, the Scottish Government recognises that lipidemia can be a distressing and painful condition. As with all long-term conditions, we want people living with lipidema to be able to access the best possible care and support wherever possible. The recommendation of any particular treatment is a matter for discussion between a patient and their doctor, and any issues surrounding the provision of a treatment are a matter for the relevant NHS board. Thank you, Roger Campbell. I thank the Minister for that answer, but can she advise whether the Scottish Government will consider how to improve the level of support offered to those who have lipoedema, and if that will include increasing the number of specialists employed by NHS Scotland? I understand at the moment there are in fact only two in Scotland. Minister. 
Yes, I understand that lipidemia can cause many difficulties and can be very painful for people who have this condition. I'm also aware that for some patients, it can take some time for them to receive the correct diagnosis. Increasing awareness of lipidemia is clearly important, and I'm pleased to note that the Royal College of General Practitioners launched a lipidemia course for GPs and medics in May 2014, which was developed in partnership with Lipidemia UK. And I also recognise the importance of the third sector in providing valuable support to those with lipidemia. My officials have confirmed they, they will update lipidemia charities about the possible opportunities of grant applications for 2015-16 under the Section 16B scheme. The Scottish Government is fully committed to providing the people of Scotland with the NHS services which meet their needs and maintain high standards of care. While the, Scot the Government provides policy, framework and resources of high quality healthcare in Scotland, it is for each NHS board to decide how best to deliver those services to meet the needs of the population. Thank you. Question number 12, John Lament. Um, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether it supports the role that community hospitals play in helping with the provision of local health care and freeing up beds in larger hospitals. Minister Jamie Hepburn. Uh, community hospitals can play a vital role in the provision of local health care and are being developed to provide a range of community services, such as uh, bed-based intermediate care services or health and social care hubs. It may be developed to provide uh, a range of medical and social care services in one place. Uh, bed-based intermediate care can be provided a step up from home as an alternative hospital admission or step down following a hospital stay. We encourage partnerships to develop more of these services as alternatives to acute hospital admission. John Lamont. I thank the Minister for that answer. The Minister may be aware that as part of a, of a review of clinical services, NHS Borders is considering the future of hospitals in Duns, Hoyke, Kelso and Peebles. I have been flooded by emails and letters from concerned residents, patients and staff who can't understand why busy local hospitals which free up beds in the Borders General Hospital might be lost. The Scottish Government's community hospital strategy says that community hospitals are an important part, is more important than ever in providing both health and social care services for local communities. And the Scottish Government's vision for health care includes shifting the balance of care from large institutions into community settings. Has the Minister had any discussion, discussions with NHS Borders over the, the suggestion that facilities in Duns, Hoyk, Peebles and Kelso may close? And given the Scottish Government's apparent support for community hospitals, will the Minister join me in making it clear to NHS Borders that these local, facil local facilities must stay open and rule out supporting any closures in the Borders? Minister. Let me acknowledge that uh, Mr Lamont is uh, doing uh, what you might expect. He is, of course, representing his uh, constituency uh, interest. I should say we should not put the cart before the horse uh, here. This is uh, ultimately a matter for NHS uh, boards, and I am aware that they are proposing to carry out a review of all uh, of their clinical services, not just uh, community hospitals. What I would say is I would expect uh, any review to be carried out in line with our uh, 2020 uh, vision for the uh, future of uh, health care in uh, uh, Scotland and uh, uh, these proposals will have to give uh, clear evidence of how uh, the board would uh, address uh, the impact and outcomes for people and communities. Thank you. Question 13, Mark Griffin. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether it considers staffing levels in NHS Lanarkshire satisfactory. Cabinet Secretary. In NHS Lanarkshire, staff <coughs> in post numbers are at a record high, the number of consultants is at a record high, and the number of qualified nurses and midwives are at a record high. NHS boards, including NHS Lanarkshire, are responsible for ensuring that they have the correct mix and number of staff to deliver and maintain high-quality services for their patients. We expect all NHS boards to plan for their workforce, utilising staff banks where appropriate. And we have supported the development of workload and workforce planning tools, the use of which were mandated in April 2013. Mark Griffin. Thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Is the Cabinet Secretary aware that the Out of Hours Service in Cumbernauld has now been closed since June 2014 because of a lack of available GPs, meaning local people now have to travel to Monklands Hospital in Airdrie, adding more pressure to that service? Does the Minister think that it is acceptable that that situation has been allowed to drag on for over seven months? And what ac action can she take to get Cumbernauld out of our service operational again? Cabinet Secretary. 
Uh, well, obviously, uh, Mark Griffin will be aware that NHS Lanarkshire is embarking on a review of their out-of-hours uh, services. What I can say is it is very important that uh, NHS Lanarkshire move to ensure that the out-of-hours service meets the needs of the local population. Uh, I hope that Mark Griffin will welcome the fact that NHS Lanarkshire is actually one of the biggest gainers of the NRAC uplift that I announced this week and is set to receive £13.5 million in next year's budget. I'm sure that will help when they come to uh, the, the design and provision of their out-of-hours services. Question 14, Alison McInnes. To ask the Scottish Government what its position is on the availability of child and adolescent mental health services in North East Scotland. Minister Jamie Hepburn. Uh, NHS boards have done significant work in service redesign to increase the capacity, their capacity to meet the CAMS target on a sustainable uh, basis. As a result of redesign, NHS Grampian uh, have already identified where they need to increase capacity and we support the board and the work they have done on the back of a process that gives sustainable performance inpatient facilities covering the north of Scotland, which includes the NHS Grampian, is provided by Dudhope House in Dundee, which is a further six beds becoming available in May 2015. The additional six beds will increase the bed base serving the north of Scotland and improve the quality of the estate. Arthur McInnes. As the Minister says, there is no CAMS in inpatient facility in the NHS Grampian area. Instead, a young patient from, say, my hometown of Ellen would be placed over 100 miles away from home in Raidmore Hospital in Inverness where currently the sole CAMS NHS bed is in the north. Even Dudhope House, as the Minister mentions, is more than 82 miles away. How are families to support their children at such distances? One GP responding to a recent SAMH survey said, for mental health, it needs to be local, 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 and as much as possible, face-to-face. -face. Does the please. Minister agree? And how does he intend to improve access for my younger constituents to local, responsive and age-appropriate services? Minister. Well, of course, there is always a, an important balance to be had, and I recognise that where we can provide services as local as possible, we should seek to do that. These are, of course, specialist services, and we can't uh, provide them, sadly, uh, uh, absolutely every uh, location. That's why they are located in specialist centres. But there is the, always the possibility beds can be made uh, available uh, at uh, other locations in uh, certain circumstances where that might be appropriate, uh, and uh, that can uh, be taken forward. Thank you. Question 15, Mary Fee. Presiding officer, to ask the Scottish Government what requirement there is on health boards to undertake adverse incident reviews in respect of patients dying whilst on the delayed discharge database. Cabinet Secretary Shona Robinson. NHS boards must ensure that a system to record these cases is in place and the medical director should consider all such cases and carry out a review if it were thought that the delay in discharge had been a contributory factor to the person's death. Any adverse incident review should be carried out in line with guidance in the learning from adverse incidents through reporting and review document. Mary Fee. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for her answer? There were 1,000 deaths of patients on the delayed discharge database. In other words, patients fit for discharge. A Freedom of Information request by the Labour Health team shows that only two reviews were carried out. Does the Minister find this appropriate? And if not, what action will be taken? Cabinet Secretary. Well, the number of reviews that would be carried out would be if it was thought that the delay in discharge had been a contributory factor to the person's death. And there is a process through the guidance that I described in my earlier answer, learning from adverse incidents through reporting and review document that sets out which cases uh, should be reviewed in that way. Now, you know, we are talking about here very frail elderly people, uh, many of which uh, who have uh, had a, a number of conditions. But I would be the first to absolutely acknowledge that even when it comes to end of life care, a hospital is not the place that many any of those frail elderly people would want to, uh, to, to die. They would want to die with their family at home and quite rightly so they should be given that option. That is why I have said absolutely that dealing with delayed discharge and eradicating delayed discharge out of the health system is absolutely my top priority and it's for that very reason that it is so. Thank you. Question number 16 has been withdrawn and a satisfactory explanation has been provided. Question number 17, John Pentland. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what measures it has taken to protect NHS staff in light of the recent reports of high levels of injuries at work and sick leave due to stress. Cabinet Secretary. Our staff are 
At the heart of the NHS, their health and wellbeing is something the government takes very seriously. The staff government governance standard for NHS Scotland commits all boards to providing a continuously improving and safe working environment, promoting the health and wellbeing of staff, patients and the wider community. Through our monitoring arrangements, we are ensuring that boards have policies and actions in place uh, to support staff. Thank you. John Penland. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that response? And I'm sure everyone will agree that injuries and sickness within the NHS are a serious problem, whatever the cause. But would the Minister agree that, that it would be useful to have a regu regular updates made available by health boards about the nature and incidence of such problems and what action they are taking to address them? Cabinet Secretary. Yes, I would agree with John Pentland. I think that may well be uh, something that would be useful, um, and I can certainly be happy to, to look at how we could do that. I think it is important that we understand the nature of, of those injuries, um, particularly where um, the uh, violence has been involved in any of those. Um, and I think, importantly, as John Pentland also said, what action each board is taking to address uh, those, those issues. So I'm very happy to take that forward and I'll get back to the member in due course. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. That concludes questions this afternoon. And we therefore turn to the next item of business, which is a debate on motion number 12045.